Thank you very much, Kel, for the introduction. Thank you, Father Ellis, for having me. And uh, it's a delight to be here. I've been thrilled to learn over the past year about the way that Villanova University cherishes its relationship to Gregor Mendel and his legacy. And uh, we have the splendid relics uh, out here in the front. Uh, and uh, I, I'm honored to be participating today and to be part of such a distinguished panel. So my own talk is going to be focused on Mendel's paper. So I've given it the cheeky title, What Happens in Mendel's Paper? That's meant to be an homage to a famous book about Hamlet, What Happens in Hamlet. Uh, now, you might think you don't need to talk about this because we all know what happens in Mendel's paper. Anybody who's wandered anywhere near a biology classroom, once the topic got into inheritance, will have learned about Gregor Mendel. Uh, this is taken from the university textbook used at Leeds and many other places. Uh, he is the father of the science of genetics. And you're introduced to the man and you're introduced to his work, the work which was reported in the paper that we've been hearing about in Simon's and, and Ondra's uh, presentations. So what is it that, that Mendel did, uh, the students learn? Well, uh, the reason Mendel got into the textbooks is that, first of all, having decided to study the garden pea uh, and concentrating on characters which were either or, uh, flower color in this case, either purple or white, he spent two years purifying his stalks, making sure that his purple flowering pea plants only ever produced purple flowering plants, so they were true breeding. Likewise, the white flowering pea plants only ever produced white flowering progeny. Two years purifying the stalks, only at that point did he begin his experimentation. Carefully crossing the stalks. And then the first of what would go on to be an escalating series of discoveries. In this case, that when you brought together the purple flowering stalks and the white flowering stalks, all of the progeny uh, showed purple flowers. A pattern which was new to the natural sciences, one of many reported in this 1866 paper, a, a number of regularities discovered, but also amazing explanations. So how does Mendel go on to account for uh, this pattern. Well, suppose that in the purple flowering pea plants, underlying the purpleness of the flowers, there are purple making factors. You can call them big P. And then in the white flowering pea plants, there are white making factors, call those little p. And you know because the purple flowering pea plants are true breeding, when it comes to flower color, there's nothing in there except the purple making factor, big P. And then the white flowering pea plants likewise, there's nothing in there but the white making factor, little p. So what happens when you cross? Well, uh, upon crossing, the purple making factor and the white making factor come together, but you only ever see purpleness. And what that shows you, Mendel says, is that one of the characters is dominant to the other. Purpleness is dominant, whiteness is recessive. Now by that he only meant visible or otherwise in this first hybrid generation. So we all encounter this and, and then go on from there and then it gets harder uh, as the textbook goes on, as the genetics uh, uh, pedagogy carries on. And you have to get to university to learn about all of these things. I've taken this uh, pretty good instruction in Mendel's Basics from a horrible science annual that, uh, that my kids have. Uh, you see here, uh, oh dear, the Austrian monk. So it's not just Wikipedia, it's worse than that. Uh, <laughs> the Austrian monk there with his purple flowers. He gets some good gags. Uh, there he is in the refectory uh, ladling out pea soup. What? Uh, pea soup again, Brother Mendel? Not for you, bro. There's no peas for the wicked. <laughs> so this is aimed at 10 and 11-year-olds. Uh, you get Mendel Kitsch 
Uh, he's on mouse mats, obey Mendelian principles, it's the laws of inheritance. I actually bought a tie that has that, but I forgot to bring the one occasion when I could have worn it with impunity, <laughs> uh, uh, but I didn't bring it. So we all end up with a sense of knowing what is in this paper, the paper which is at the foundations of genetics. But since the uh, previous Mendel anniversary, 1965 through to the present, uh, my tribe, the historians of science, have put in an awful lot of, I think, rather brilliant work to put Mendel's paper back into its own time and place. In other words, to historicize it. And what I'm going to try to do in, in my lecture this morning is to give you a greatest hits uh, a version of what they have helped us to uh, to understand in Mendel's paper, all of the ways in which it belongs not to the future of genetics, right, which Mendel didn't know about, but to the world that Mendel actually inhabited, the world so uh, evocatively brought to life in Simon's and Ondra's lectures. And some of what I'm going to say will be more or less alarming to some of you, depending on how invested you are in certain versions of what is actually in Mendel's paper. So I'm going to uh, concentrate on four topics. First of all, I'm going to take his title seriously, Experiments in, on Plant Hybrids. And I want to suggest, again following others, uh, that he and that there's a job of work for us in understanding what it is to suppose that Mendel's topic was not inheritance, but plant hybridization, why that might matter. Secondly, and this is going to be the most alarming part um, of, of my presentation, I want to suggest that we should take his notation seriously. That sounds trivial, uh, but actually on, on the basis of it hangs uh, a fundamental reinterpretation of what it is that Mendel thought he was proposing. Put it another way, in following one of the, the great historians of this, this period, 1965 to the present, uh, why Mendel was no Mendelian. Thirdly, I want to uh, help us take the remarks in the paper on cell theory seriously. I think more than anything else in the paper, they'll help remind us that there is no way in which Gregor Mendel was isolated scientifically, intellectually, when he was doing his work. He was part of one of the most advanced biological discussions in the planet. Finally, and this is more me than anybody, uh, uh, anybody else, but uh, I want to suggest that, that we take his background in physics a little less seriously than is traditional. Uh, one way of thinking about Mendel's achievement is that he brought a physics attitude to the problems of biology, and in particular, botany. Uh, and without wanting to say that that's uh, entirely misleading, I want to suggest that uh, there are other ways of looking at it, which again, help us appreciate quite what it is that Mendel saw himself as doing, quite what it is he saw himself as contributing to. And then toward the end, I, I'm going to sketch in some of the areas which are still very much actively under debate. And we discovered over, over dinner last night uh, that if you get three historians interested in Mendel together, they will disagree about more or less everything. Uh, and I want to sketch out some of what it remains actively under disagreement, partly because, as Simon uh, said, there is so little to go on when it comes to a documentary archive, uh, but, but also because there are genuinely complex issues of, of, of interpretation, uh, even with the documents that survive. So that's, uh, that's where I'm going. Begin with the title. Taking the title seriously, Experiments on Plant Hybrids. Here's what Mendel tells us his aim is. He doesn't say, my aim is to found a new science of inheritance. Right? Nothing like that. Here's what he says. His aim is to formulate a generally applicable law governing the formation and development of hybrids. Right? So the question here is not, how does inheritance work? I mean, explicitly, that's not his question. But rather, what is the law governing variable as distinct from constant hybrids? And what accounts for that law causally? 
Let me try to make sense of that. Now, uh, as, as we've heard, when it comes to hybridization, uh, Mendel very self-consciously saw himself as building upon and improving upon the work of some distinguished predecessors. Kohlreuter uh, Gertner uh, was mentioned. And from them, he acquired his sense of his problem. And it comes to understanding a distinction which our biology does not recognize or honor, uh, but which he took for granted, coming from the people that he honored and admired. And it's a distinction between constant hybrids and variable hybrids. And, and here's how to think about that. So in the case of a constant hybrid, you've got two plants. Let's call them A and B. You hybridize them together, and you get a new plant, or a plant with a new character. Call that C. You breed from C, and you get the same new character. And it continues to stay. It continues to persist. That's constancy for Mendel. That's one class of phenomena. There are some hybrids he says, which are constant, and that's what he means by constant. There are other hybrids which are variable. So here we take A and B, put them together. Again, we get, we get C. But when you breed from C, oh dear, you don't carry on with that new character. The old stuff comes back again. So Mendel frames his paper as an inquiry into one of the two big classes of hybrids as he understood it. And it was very interesting for me presenting uh, an earlier version of this talk at the conference uh, in September where I met uh, Kel and Father Ellis uh, because it was a room full of biologists. And this made no sense to them whatsoever. It was really agitating to them. But this is how Mendel carved up the territory. Two kinds of hybrid, constant hybrids, variable hybrids. His paper is about the variable hybrids. He's not in denial about there being this other class of hybrids that he claims to throw no light on whatsoever. He's focusing in on this class, the hybrids where once you put them together, the old stuff comes back again. That's what he's trying to illuminate. And in thinking about this in relation to the larger question of what happens historically to Mendel's paper, how it comes to be looked back upon after its rediscovery in 1900 as foundational for a new quantitative experimental science of inheritance, which quickly gets called Mendelism. I've come to think about the distinct, be, distinction between means and ends. One of the things that happens between 1866 and 1900 is that hybridization goes from being an end in itself as something to understand, how does hybridization work, to being seen as a perspicuous means for understanding something else, namely inheritance, and related to inheritance, variation, and evolution. And that's a complex story of uh, scientific development over th uh, three plus decades. But for understanding Mendel's paper, for situating it in its own time, we need to take seriously that notion of what Mendel thought he was doing. He was trying to illuminate variable hybrids. What is the law governing them? And if you can find the law, how do you account for it in terms of causation in terms of what's actually happening in the bodies of plants. Okay. Secondly, taking his notation seriously. I said this sounds so trivial, but it's so not, as we'll see. So, Mendel writes big A for the true breeding parental plants where the modern geneticist would write big A, big A. think that's just not a big deal. It's just shorthand. Why write two when you can write one? But Olby, uh, in the late 1970s, came to a different view. When you begin taking seriously Mendel's only using big A to represent the true breeding parental plants,
You're led to question whether Mendel himself held anything like the atomic conception of hereditary factors, which comes to be considered Mendelian. So what else could there be going, what else could there be in the paper? What conception of what's happening in bodies uh, is active? Well, one way to think about it is that for Mendel, the purple making stuff and the white making stuff could be thought of as reversibly mixing fluids. So I say this is the most alarming part of my paper. Uh, so let me, let me go through it slowly, see if I can make sense of this. Uh, I've given you purple and white. Let's take another classic Mendelian pair, yellow and green. So we've got uh, yellow seeded peas and green seeded peas. Bring them together. We get uh, all the peas uh, showing yellow seededness in the first hybrid generation. And then, as, as was mentioned, when these self-fertilize, greenness comes back. And in the ratio of three yellow to one green. Now, how does Mendel explain that? Uh, earlier, when I gave you a Mendelian explanation, I gave you the textbook version. I'm now going to try to ventriloquize the 1866 Mendel's paper version on the historian's revisionist reading of it. So here goes. What have we got in the yellow seeded pea plant? Right? We've got yellow making stuff. But maybe we should think of that stuff as a kind of a fluid. There are no grounds for reading the paper as supposing that Mendel thought of it as particulate. Likewise, in the green seeded pea plant, we have green making stuff. So what happens when you bring those together? The yellow making stuff and the green making stuff come together in one plant. Only yellowness is visible. Right? And thus, again, as, as, as per the usual reading, yellowness is dominant to greenness. But then what happens? During gamete formation, the formation of pollen and egg cells, the fluids reverse. They unmix. And thus you get, out of the, the first hybrid, the gametes either having yellowness yellow making stuff or green making stuff. So kind of like oil and, oil and water. They come together, they hold together for a certain period, but then they come out again. And they come out without being together. They come out and separate. And then the rest works as per the textbook. And it's so lovely, we should have a look, right? The uh, yellow making gamete meets a yellow making gamete, you get yellow. Yellow meets green, yellow beats green, you get yellow. Green comes together with A, again, uh, yellow beats green, you get yellow. Only in the one case does green come together with green and you get your three to one explained. So the classical Mendelian pattern is still makes sense, but you don't need to suppose in making sense of it on Mendelian terms that Mendel thought of there being a discrete yellow making entity which causes the yellowness. Now, I picked this up off the internet, Al Gore's invention. Uh, this is the kind of thing one often sees said about Mendel. Mendel said that blending inheritance does not occur. And here we get blending implies that offspring have a simple mixture of the parent's characteristics. Mendel showed that characteristics from each parent are separate and that offspring inherit the characteristics of one or other parents depending on certain rules of inheritance. No, stop. Stop teaching this. Uh, it's, it's fundamentally ahistorical and I think it's confusing. Uh, it confuses so many issues. Uh, as I've tried to stress, inheritance just isn't Mendel's problem. And so the question of whether it's blending or not doesn't come up for him. We bring that back to the paper. Likewise, he doesn't say across the board that it's never the case that when two parents have offspring, the offspring have characters which are intermediate. That's not at all part of the mission of the paper. Uh, in a lot of ways, you can, you can see Mendel's paper as illuminating uh, those cases in which, in which they do. It just so happens, rather peculiarly, that in the P case, 
uh, when the hybrid character emerges, it's not something intermediate. It's identical to one of the parental characters. Okay, third revisionist point. Taking the cell remarks seriously in the paper. So apropos of what I said a moment ago about how to think about yellowness and greenness coming together as kind of fluids, which then reversibly unmix. Here's a quotation from, uh, from the paper. Mendel says, the attribution attempted here of the essential difference in the development of the hybrids to a permanent or temporary union of the differ differing cell elements. So this takes us back again to that opening contrast I drew for you between constant hybrids and variable hybrids. What Mendel seems to be suggesting here is that in the constant hybrids, which on the whole his paper is not about, what happens is that the different stuffs come together and they stick. The union is permanent. Thus, the constancy of the hybrid. By contrast, in variable hybrids, what his paper is about, the union of the stuffs is temporary. When gametes form, they reverse out again. And he relates this explicitly to understandings of the cell. And he really means it. The only lengthy footnote in the paper is a footnote about cell theory. Uh, and it's on the empirically vindicated causal equivalence. So uh, laboratory work showing that it doesn't matter uh, which plant is used to provide the egg cells and which plant is used to provide the pollen cells, that male and female contribute equally. Uh, as he says, the egg cell is not in any way, shape, or form a kind of nurse, a kind of maternal matrix with the activity all coming from the pollen. Uh, it has, he says, no effect on his results, which is the seed parent and which is the pollen parent. So this really matters to him. He, he, he goes on about it at, at some length. Uh, but what it shows us is that Mendel was plugged in to the most advanced conversation about the nature of cells and their role in reproduction. Uh, and the person who's written best about this, we've just heard about, was Vityaslav Orel. And I'm sorry for the, 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 the fuzzy image. Uh, but Orel's uh, book on Mendel is uh, very much worth reading. But it's particularly, I think, brilliant uh, in showing the extent to which the monastery in general, and Mendel in particular, were uh, f attentive to the most advanced discussions in cell theory. The, the in that theory visited, uh, Brun visited the monastery. Uh, and so uh, of all the parts of the paper, which I think uh, represent how uh, non-isolated Mendel was, how fully he was part of a thriving scientific community, far in advance when it comes to these topics than what was happening in Britain uh, or, or anywhere else, uh, it's these, these uh, remarks on cell theory. OK, my fourth point. Not taking physics so seriously, the, his time under, under Christian Doppler. So it's tempting to attribute everything which is methodologically classy about the paper to his physics training. So I said, thus we get this image of the physicist in the garden, someone who wasn't just a botanist. Why? Because he brought this physics attitude. He wasn't afraid of mathematics. He, wasn't, he was well-trained in experimentation. He was willing to stand back from the data and idealize and, and uh, identify general laws and be bold in formulating hypotheses to explain these. The problem with this is that it misses out the extent to which, in Central Europe, biology itself was a hybrid physics, biology, for some period. Uh, and that Mendel was himself the inheritor of this physics-biology integration. And there, there are two sciences. I'll say a little bit about each of them, uh, and then we'll come back to the paper to see how, how this matters for understanding the paper. Uh, one was called Humboldtian biogeography, after Alexander von Humboldt. The other, Goethean morphology, after Johann uh, von Goethe. And these came together for Mendel in the person of his teacher, 
in plant physiology at Vienna University, Franz Unger. So let's take each of those one by one. First, Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt. There's a great new biography about him. He's become fashionable again. Uh, Humboldt uh, was revered throughout the scientific world in the first half of the 19th century. But what did he stand for? Uh, he stood for what he called terrestrial physics. And it was a science which united the collection of very large sets of quantitative data, uh, data on temperature, uh, on climactic conditions, on magnetic intensity, and try to relate all of that to the distribution of species in different places. What are the laws governing the distribution of species? Where well, those laws are understood to be physical and quantitative. So that's part of what is happening. And you can see already how this science brings together the biological uh, and the physical. Next, Gertzian morphology, uh, a, a science which, which grows from uh, Goethe's pioneering work in searching for the ur forms underlying the diversity of plant and animal morphologies, forms. It's not often remembered that this, too, was a science which sought laws of life and expected those laws to be quantitative. Uh, this diagram uh, relates to something known as Schimper's Law, uh, published in, in 1830, and shows how the placing of leaves on a stem as it, as it grows spiral up in ways which can be represented as ratios of the Fibonacci sequence. Again, the physical and mathematical come together with the biological in the search for laws of life. All of this in advance of Gregor Mendel coming to Vienna University, where these two traditions come together for him in the teaching of Franz Unger. Unger, who said he wanted a physics of the plant organism. After his time in Unger's classroom, Mendel goes back to the monastery and almost right away begins his experiments. They are, as Sander Gliboff, whose work I'm drawing on here, uh, has aptly put it, Austro-Ungarian uh, experiments. And I think once you appreciate this, once you see Mendel not as having invented a kind of physics-style biology, but as being part of a tradition and contributing to it, uh, so contributing to Gartner's and Kohlreuter's questions about hybridization uh, in a way which reflected what he'd been learning in Unger's classroom and, and the, the ambition he'd acquired to, uh, in, in a Goethean, Humboldtian way, work out mathematically precise laws for changes in form over time. You notice that in the paper, and I do hope you'll actually go back to the paper. In the paper, there is a law which you never learn about when you learn Biology 101 and you're taught Mendel's laws. I don't mean to suggest that biologists as a class have forgotten about this, but when it comes to basic instruction in Mendelism, this comes as a surprise, and it's the most physics-like moment in the whole paper. The thing to, to look at, first of all, is in the, the bottom, your right corner. And uh, my, my word wasn't as good as it, but you should read that as 2 to the n minus 1 to 2 to 2 to the n minus 1. If that doesn't look like a law, but that's not typically what one learns when one learns about Mendel's laws. What is that about? This is from a part of the paper where um, having already laid out the classic conceptions, dominance and recessiveness and the three to one ratio, Mendel asks himself, and I should just say, so this is typical of the paper. It is a brilliant paper, not least because it's kind of intellectually relentless. It just pursues each of its questions as far as they'll go. Mendel asks himself, well, what's going to happen after that second hybrid generation? And what he says is that you can actually frame a very simple generalization where n equals the number of generations. But you have to start counting, as it were, from the third generation. 
And what he shows, and this matters to him, is that as the generations succeed, the proportion of hybrid plants in any generation will diminish. But it will nevertheless never go down to zero. So having brought these hybrids together for all of the uh, variability, there's nevertheless a sense in which the hybridization remains permanent. And quantitatively, he's able to work out the extent to which it diminishes, but without disappearing. So I said, this is the most physics-like moment in the whole paper, the most abstract, mathematically general moment. We never learn about it because it doesn't matter for what we come to think of as Mendelism. But it matters if you're an Austro-Hungarian student of plant hybridization. And what you're trying to do is to come up with a mathematical law which will illuminate what happens over the long run in the changes in the distribution of plant forms. So to review, I've suggested first of all that uh, if we want to be more historical about Mendel's paper, putting it back into its own time and place, we could do worse than take his title seriously. What it meant to be making a contribution on plant hybridization. And I tried to suggest to you that we shouldn't just be charitable and plug in inheritance when Mandel says plant hybridization. He really meant plant hybridization. Secondly, that we take his notation seriously. Big A rather than big A, big A represents the difference between an non-atomic or atomic conception of what's underlying plant form. And as I say, the, the most revisionist historians have suggested that there's just no reason to read back the atomic conception that comes to be called Mendelian. The remarks on cell theory remind us that this was someone who was part of a very sophisticated research culture where cell theory was more advanced than anywhere else in the biological world, and the paper fundamentally reflects that in ways that matter to Mendel. And then finally, when it comes to thinking about how far this was the work of a physicist who come to biology, I want to suggest that that's not at all the best way of thinking about the paper. I don't mean to suggest that he learned nothing from the Physics Institute time, uh, but we shouldn't attribute everything which is classy about the paper, to that. As we saw, uh, for Humboldtian reasons, for Goethean reasons, biology was already uh, hybridized between physics and biology. But, uh, as I say, there's more to discuss about the paper. There are a number of disagreements which are, which are ongoing. And I want to just touch on two areas of them uh, be before I, I conclude. One is the question of how far the practical improvement culture of Brno and uh, the Austro-Hungarian world generally matters for understanding Mendel's paper. Uh, that culture was, again, well brought out in Simon's and Ondra's presentation. There's absolutely no question that Mendel himself was a participant uh, in that culture. I'm increasingly com coming to think, but we're disagreeing about that, that when Mendel died, he was probably better known and esteemed for his work with bees uh, and his work in, with fruit trees than for his work with, with peas. So Mendel was part of that culture. He was rewarded for being part of that culture. But how far should we relate all of that to the 1866 paper? Uh, Simon and Ondra both mentioned uh, Abbot Knapp's uh, participation in the Sheep Breeders Association, all of these practical improvement associations, and a discussion in 1837, which now gets picked out, uh, at the end of which Knapp says, if I'm not mis misremembering, we need to ask the question, how does inheritance work? What is inheritance and how does it work? Now, on my reading, as it were, as the, the, the historian of science's uh, revisionist reading of this paper, uh, that looks suspect. Not in that it didn't happen, but if you ask yourself, what is the matrix, the creative matrix, for Mendel's paper? Was it a stray remark at the end of a, of a conference on sheep breeding 20 years before Mendel started his, his work with 
pea plants in the monastery garden? Or was it what he'd just been studying at the University of Vienna with this politically radical, scientifically radical teacher, Franz Unger? My hunch, you'll have guessed, is that the latter context is the more illuminating. But it's by no means, it's by no means knocked down, and also it probably that the truth lies somewhere, somewhere in between the two. But it remains something to be worked out. It's also, one should say, not politically innocent. Uh, Ondra touched in his presentation on the ways in which Mendel's work was handled and uh, dealt with during the communist period in, uh, in, in the Czechoslovakia, as then was. Someone like Orel and Krzyzienecki had a real political problem on their hands in uh, making Mendel uh, acceptable politically in 1965 with Khrushchev breathing down their necks, uh, trying to do something with this man who was German speaking, who was Catholic. Uh, he's problematic politically in a communist period. And one way one might think to make Mendel appear that bit more acceptable culturally in the mid-1960s, right, at the, at, in the height of the Cold War, is to stress the extent to which Mendel was not some sterile, uh, off in the ivory tower contributor to theoretical science, but a man of the people, working for the good of the people. And that's very much in my reading of him, or else Mendel. Uh, that isn't to say that that Mendel wasn't the, a real one, but uh, it's just to say that he comes to attention at a moment politically uh, when, as it were, one might expect something like that to be said of Mendel. So in, in raising these questions at a, at a conference like this, we're not only confronting the question, you know, how should we read this paper, but how do we relate uh, ourselves to these traditions of interpretation, which are themselves part of history. Secondly, uh, Charles Darwin uh, has already come up. The question of Mendel and Darwin is multifaceted and, and very complicated. We know that Mendel read the uh, German translation of The Origin of Species. It's there at the Mendel Museum. Uh, disappointingly in certain respects, illuminatingly in other respects, Mendel's annotations are just on the parts which bore on plant hybrids. Uh, and, and they show up in the paper. So, for example, there is a moment in the 1866 paper where Mendel asks himself uh, about uh, what it means to be working with varieties within a species as distinct from different species. And what he says is that, well, as we all know, uh, there is no hard and fast line between varieties and species. That is straight out of Darwin, it seems to me. And, and those passages are annotated in Mendel's copy. Uh, likewise, uh, Mendel talks in the paper about what was regarded in 19th century biology as the well-known fact that the domestication of plants and animals itself induces variability. Again, not something that our biology recognizes as a truth, but just taken for granted by Darwin. It's, it's what Darwin talks about on page one of The Origin. It's absolutely fundamental to Darwin's arguments in The Origin. And it's right there in Mendel's paper. So kind of in, in not very consequential ways, Mendel's reading of Darwin shows up in the paper. We know that he read Darwin. But then things get tricky. Because by 1866, when Mendel actually publishes his paper, Darwinismus is not innocent in his context. Uh, Ernst Haeckel has become the great evangelist for Darwin. And in ways that Darwin doesn't himself always uh, uh, approve of, uh, Haeckel allies Darwinism to a very strong anti-clericalism, part of a cultural putsch on his part. So Darwinism is culturally challenging in Central Europe not least in the abbey or the monastery or whatever we're allowed to call it now. Uh, and, the, and so one asks, well, what, what, is Mendel, what is Mendel doing? How is Mendel relating to all of this? 
And there is one tradition of interpretation which goes like this, that out of Linnaeus comes a view of hybridization as part of God's plan for how species come to uh, fill up the earth. So uh, on Linnaeus's vision, God put almost all the species that we see around us on the earth. But God left a certain amount of filling out to do uh, in a way which is completely preordained, and that filling out was done by hybridization. So there's a sense in which a concentration on hybridization could be seen as a way of resisting a Darwinian view of how species come to be and how they come to, to, uh, to be as diverse as they are. Uh, that uh, hybridization belongs to this more uh, devout, more uh, 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 acceptable version of evolutionism. I'm not excited by that myself, but a number of, of my colleagues are, and that's one way of reading, reading the paper. There are also suggestive remarks in the correspondence with Nageli, uh, Nageli who did identify himself uh, as a Darwinian, that Mendel was certainly aware of all of these things, uh, but again, exactly where he placed himself isn't entirely clear. Um, because it's already come up, I should also address this question of what if, what if Darwin had read Mendel? We know that he didn't, but what if he had? Uh, and I've actually looked to see what was happening in Darwin's life in the, the uh, February and March 1865, at the very moment when, miles away, Mendel was giving his lectures. Uh, and uh, among other things, Darwin was preparing the work which would become, in 1868, his two-volume Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. And in that volume, uh, it, or rather in, in one of those two volumes, there's a passage in which Darwin talks about an experiment with snapdragons, in which he took two varieties of snapdragon, bred them together, uh, all the characters were uniform, he then self let those self-fertilize, and out of the, out of the next generation, you got numbers, which to the post-Mendelian reader look amazingly like the three to one ratio. So Darwin, that passage in Darwin gets remembered after 1900 as showing just how close biology got. Uh, once you get to Ronald Fisher in the 1930s, Fisher looks back and says, oh, if only Darwin had read Mendel, we could have saved 60 years of biological disagreement. Imagine how much would have gone on. So let's suppose Darwin had read Mendel. What would have happened? Most likely, nothing. Mendel would have just gone on the pile. As I read Darwin at, at that moment, but again, this is, this is pretty conventional for historians of science, there's a sense in which Mendel, as we've seen, is working on something quite a lot smaller than inheritance, the question of hybridization and the laws that govern it. Darwin, at that moment, is looking for something much larger than inheritance. He's trying to relate inheritance generally to a grand theory which explains the production of life at every level, from the healing of wounds to the creation of offspring. At the end of his variation of animals and plants, he frames this. Uh, he calls it his hypothesis of pangenesis. And it's gone down in history as Darwin's worst theory. Uh, so it's often thought, you know, Mendel got it right, Darwin got it wrong, but they were asking very different kinds of questions. And had Darwin read Mendel's work, he would very likely have read it as throwing light on that part of his larger inquiry, which was to do with hybrids. And what it showed, as Mendel thought it showed, is that some hybrids are variable, and that with variable hybrids, you get interesting patterns, which might be explained by this interesting causal hypothesis. But in no way did it explain hybrids as such, much less the question of inheritance. And there's also, I should say, a, a sense in which you can look at the hawkweeds research as differently once you understand that distinction. Rather than the hawkweeds research being a failed attempt to extend the P experiments, you could see it as a good start made on the other side of that divide. So the P work was looking at variable hybrids. The hawkweed work was looking at constant hybrids. And he made a good start. I mean, he, he got onto the hawkweed because Gertner and others had identified hawkweed as producing uh, constancy after the, after the F1. 
so uh, again, I think if we, if we, for all that it's tempting to look back mournfully at what didn't happen, the uncut pages in, in the, the volume in Darwin's library, I think once one's gone historical uh, on the paper and Mendel's context and Darwin's context, we should see that very likely it wouldn't have had much of a consequence at all on Darwin. And I'm obliged to end by saying that uh, the British Society for the History of Science uh, will in the next year publish a new English translation of Mendel's paper. Uh, it will be freely available on the web with